Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's good for us to worship the Lord together in spirit and in truth. Before we begin, I just had uh, one announcement. We offer our Christian sympathies to Bob and Marion Bielman and their families with the passing of Bob's father this past week. We continue to lift them up in prayer as they grieve a loss of a dear father and grandfather. And we just pray that uh, God will sustain this family through this difficult time. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 8. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. Now when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, What is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds and the animals of the wild. The birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Receive God's greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. Last week I asked that you could draw some pictures of people from all different races and ages and all sorts of variety. And we have some pictures to share with you. Ella Hunink, thank you so much, Ella, for those beautiful, that beautiful picture of so many people. And we have one from Bridget as well. Thank you, Bridget. That was very well done. We have another one from Daniel, all sorts of people holding hands. Thank you, Daniel. We also have one from Tiffany with all sorts of people in a circle. Lord, uh, thank you for that, Tiffany. That was really well done. We also have something from the DeWitt family, Cassandra and Ryan and Annika and Erica. You guys did a lot of work here. I see you cut out lots of pictures from different magazines, and that is really beautiful. I'm just going to show the full, bigger picture of that, and we're thankful that you guys could do that. Thanks so much for sharing with us. Isn't that wonderful, church family? All right, let's have a prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the diversity in your creation, the diversity of peoples, Lord, that you have created. We're thankful for these boys and girls who could share their gifts with us and to show us all the different kinds of people. We give you thanks, Lord God, that your plan includes unifying all of us together in one. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, our scripture reading is from Genesis chapter 3. It's the story of the fall. 
Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit of the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly, and and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree, which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters, last week we started a series on racism. 
And we found out that racism is diametrically opposed to God's amazing redemption plan. To be in Christ is to be reconciled with one another as a community of racially and ethnically diverse people of God. We learn these three biblical and theological principles for the development of a racially and ethnically diverse and unified family of God. The world as God created it is rich and God-glorifying in its diversity. The created world with all its diversity has its unity in the one God who created it through Jesus Christ. And the unity and diversity of the human race and of the created reality reflect the unity and diversity of the triune God, namely his oneness and threeness. I hope that our breath was taken away by the beauty of God's masterful plan last week. Because what we are seeing today is also breathtaking. Only this time, it's a literal taking away of someone's breath. It's a complete disregard for the dignity owed a human being created in the image of God. And it's the complete opposite of what God had in mind. I have a video that I would like you to watch, and I warn you, it is highly disturbing. Which doll is the pretty doll? Which doll is the nice doll? Which doll is the bad doll? Which doll is the nice doll? And why is that doll pretty? Because she's white and he has two eyes. Which doll is the ugly doll? Why is that doll ugly? Because he because he's black. Which doll looks most like you? Like me? Yeah, which one looks like you? And that one. Okay. The bad child. Because she's black, black. And why is he the ugly child? Because he he looks like he white. Why is he the dumb child? Because she has dark brown skin. Why is she the bad child? Because she makes fun of everybody else's skin color. Show me the child who has the skin color most adults like. And show me the child who has the skin color most adults don't like. Dumb child. <laughs> okay, why is she the dumb child? Because she has black skin. Show me the mean child. Why is he the mean child? Because he's brown. Show me the bad child. Why is he the bad child? Because he is black. Okay. Show me the ugly child. Why is he the ugly child? Because he's Black. ¿Por qué a mí no me gusta el color café? ¿Cuál muñeco te gusta más? Este. ¿Cuál muñeco es bueno? Este. ¿Y por qué? Porque no me dan miedo los güeros porque tengo más confianza con los... Sí, los morenos. Un poco más así como este. No tengo mucha confianza. ¿Cuál muñeco es malo? ¿Por qué? No sé. ¿Cuál muñeco es feo? Este. No sé, es que me parece que está un poquito... ¿Cómo te diría? Más moreno y no se ve tan blanco. Y no tiene mucho aspecto. And can you show me the doll that looks bad? 
Okay. And can you give, and why does that look bad? Because it's black. Hmm. And why do you think that's a nice doll? Because she's white. And can you give me the doll that looks like you? Brothers and sisters, this isn't something that happened long, long ago in a land far, far away. This is happening today in our world where not only many white people think that they are somehow superior to people of color, but people of color have bought into that giant deception as well. So what happened? How did we fall so far? Well, Genesis 3 tells us exactly what happened. A serpent, suspicion, separation, supplement, sedition, sin, and shame happened. There's a lot of S's there, aren't there? Up until this point of time, Adam and Eve are enjoying the fellowship of each other and their covenant God. Yahweh, the Lord, is his covenant name, and he is God Most High, Elohim. Did you notice that in all of Genesis chapter 2 and right up to the first part of verse 1 of our text, God is referred to as the Lord God. But not so with the serpent who we assume as being manipulated by Satan, the father of lies. From the lips of the serpent, you only hear God mentioned. Yahweh, the Lord, is left out. Do you see what the serpent is doing here? The serpent's goal is to insert suspicion of God in place of trust in God. In that video, we heard one boy say that white people are more trustworthy than people of color, and that is a lie. That's a satanic lie, one that worked back in Genesis 3 and is still working today. Elvis Presley had it right when he sang these words, We can't go on together with suspicious minds. And we can't build our dreams on suspicious minds. Satan knows that truth full well. But Satan has his work cut out for him because up until this point, Adam and Eve trusted God. The Lord God loved them and had their best interests in mind. They gratefully accepted their human destiny to live in God's world with God, his creatures, and on God's terms. So the serpent starts off his plan with a carefully worded question. But instead of restating God's positively worded command, the serpent turns it into a negative statement and twists the truth entirely. Did God really say you must not eat from any tree of the garden? Sort of like today's media who always say anti-abortion instead of pro-life. After twisting God's word, the serpent purposely leaves out the Lord when referring to God. This would be like me saying the wife instead of my dear wife, Deborah. By doing this, the serpent tries to create some separation between Eve and God, the Lord God. Forget about the relationship you have with the Lord Eve. He is God, and you are just an insignificant little creature compared to him. So how about it, Eve? Did God really say? 
As the audience, we anxiously await Eve's reply, and we cheer Eve on as she basically sets the serpent straight. We may eat fruit of the trees of the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from that middle tree, and you must not touch it, or you will die. And with the addition of these words, and you must not touch it, we, the audience, let out a collective sigh. Eve, Eve, why did you have to add those words? God's word needs no supplements. God never said that at all. He only said you must not eat from the tree. He never said you must not touch it. And with that little supplement to God's word, the serpent knew that his plan was working. At this point, the serpent goes in for the kill with his plan of sedition, his incitement of Adam and Eve to riot against their God by blatantly challenging God's word, God's authority. You will surely not die. The serpent said to the woman, For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw the fruit was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was right there beside her, by the way, the whole time, and he ate it. The desire conceived in Adam and Eve gave birth to sin. Then their eyes were opened. That part of Satan's word was true enough. But Adam and Eve did not become like God. They became a lot less like God. Their innocence was lost. The image of God was nearly obliterated in them. Their nakedness that once was beautiful was now shameful. And their trust that gave way to suspicion resulted in fear. For the first time, They were afraid of the Lord God. So when they heard God snapping twigs under his divine feet on his daily stroll through the garden, suddenly Adam and Eve did what we've all done at one time or another. They blushed. They blushed, and community was crushed. That's the principle we want to spend a little time on this morning. A fundamental effect of sin is the breakdown of community. We are relational beings, giving and receiving, loving and being loved, working with others in creative and uplifting ways, and building community. Our activities at the heart of being human and of human community. But sin has wreaked havoc on all of our relationships. The male-female relationship was the first one. Marriage is that relationship within which we develop and express much of our God-given likeness. Giving and receiving, making and keeping commitments, procreation and enjoyment. And we have seen how deeply our fall into sin harms marriages and families. But given our focus on racism, we also grieve deeply and lament how sin has impacted race relations. Racial and ethnic diversity can and should be the occasion for mutual appreciation and greater self-understanding. 
through seeing how other people live and think and relate. This would result in the glorification of God for the rich variety in human communities and cultures. All of these activities are centrally expressive of the image of God in us. In the fall, however, sin turns the very diversity that God intended to be deeply humanizing and enriching into deep alienation. It's the same separation strategy the devil initiated at the beginning. The alienation between Jew and Gentile is an overarching reality we see in the Bible. But this alienation is indicative of a much broader alienation along racial and ethnic lines. Regrettably, the primary storyline of recorded human history is the alienation of people along racial and ethnic lines. One horrible example of this is the doctrine of Christian discovery. A horrible doctrine that our National Synod of 2016 declared a heresy. I will link the full study report of this doctrine and encourage you to read it for yourselves. Now I credit Mike Wagenman, our chaplain at Western University, who made me aware of this doctrine and shared some wise and timely insights of it via a public Facebook post. After reading the report for myself, I wholeheartedly concur with Mike's reflections, some of which I'd like to share with you. Mike says this, Into all the pain, anger, and fear of these days, I wanted to offer some historical and theological reflections on why we're in this place. I feel this is important because what we're facing and dealing with is definitely not a few bad cops in Minneapolis or a racist fringe group in our North American society. The truth is far more devastating and the hope is far more beautiful. A horrible idea in Europe became official Christian doctrine and political policy nearly 600 years ago. Today, it shapes nearly everything everyone takes for granted in North America at the level of our worldview. It's called the doctrine of Christian discovery. The doctrine of Christian discovery was established through a series of church pronouncements that has resulted in broken relationships, tragic misunderstandings, and unconscious deafness towards people who are viewed as different. The doctrine of Christian discovery fueled the European exploration of the new world, the transatlantic slave trade, and the settler expansion of Canada and the United States. The doctrine of Christian discovery basically says this, that European Christians are the superior race, the most civilized people, the natural and best wielders of power, those uniquely blessed by God, and that all others are subhuman, hell-bound savages. This worldview of European and Christian superiority and privilege was, the, was then transferred to North America and has become embedded in our views of other people, in our civic institutions, our legal systems, and even in churches and theologies. Were you aware that the CRC had a residential school? The CRC, through the Board of Heathen Missions, they called it, 
decided to build a school for Navajo and Zuni children, which they named Rehoboth. Now the Lord has given us room, and we will flourish in the land. Genesis 26, 22. The Navajo and Zuni were seen by the Bilagana, the white people, as culturally incapable of accepting the gospel, which is why the goal of, a civil, of assimilation or civilizing the native was central to the work of the church. This belief is clearly illustrated in this image from the May 22, 1931 issue of the banner. Under the headline, What Christianity Accomplishes, showing a before photograph of a Navajo man in his traditional clothing. Look at the label. A pagan Indian, it says. And then a nice after photograph of a Navajo family wearing Western clothing. Individuals were seen as capable of reform, but their culture, not so much. Brothers and sisters, that's not the gospel I was taught to proclaim. I'll tell you that much. This horrible doctrine of Christian discovery is the view that says the other is to be feared, is to be exploited, is to be rejected, is to be cursed, to be enslaved, imprisoned, and killed. It is the view that says some people are more valuable than others. It is the view that says some people are disposable. Many people of color in North America have been aware of this for a long time because it has been their daily reality as the other for a long time. The rest have only recently noticed it in the news headlines and have responded with disbelief disdain, debate, or conspiracy theories. But it is this view that says that people of Japanese descent can be herded off into camps under suspicion of being spies or traitors. It is this view that says that aboriginal children can forcibly be taken from their homes and their parents to be subjected to cultural genocide. It is this view that says the law, morality, and human decency can be suspended so that those suspected of being terrorists can be tortured in secret prisons. It is this view that says a straight man can murder a gay man at a club. It is this view that says a white police officer can lynch a black man in broad daylight even while being video recorded. It is this view that contributes to the vastly disproportionate incarceration rates for U.S. black citizens and Canadian indigenous citizens. It is this view that contributes to insensitive jokes and lewd name-calling based purely on someone's ethnic or cultural or religious heritage. It is this view that moves a president to tear gas people of color so that he can have a blasphemous photo op in front of a church holding up a Bible while millions of people cheer it on as bold leadership when it's the same old face of systemic and institutionalized racism, white superiority, and colonialist religion. This view, this heretical doctrine of Christian discovery has profoundly shaped our own worldview, our society and our laws, our institution, 
our churches, our theologies, our mission boards, and the everyday lives of millions of North American citizens. This view was and still is a giant heresy. This view is wrong in every possible way. It goes against all of the principles we learned last week about being created in the image of our God. The other isn't a heathen, a barbarian, or a savage. He is a brother. She is a sister. We're all descended from the same parents, and we share the one and only Creator God. And we all need to work together to undo this long and deep history and its ongoing institutionalist oppression. Now to those who say, let's just, what, let's just let what happened in the past stay in the past. Well, I'm not responsible for all that happened years and years ago. Listen to these wise words from Lakota Elder Dan to settler author Kent Nurburn in The Wolf at Twilight. Okay, says Dan, let me try to lay this out straight for you. I'm not saying any of this is your fault or even that your grandparents did any of it. I'm saying it happened. And it happened on your people's watch. You're the one who benefited from it. It doesn't matter that you're way downstream from the actual events. You're still drinking the water. You're still drinking the water. I don't care if you feel guilty. I just care that you take some responsibility. Responsibility about what you do now. Not about feeling bad about what happened in the past. You can't erase the footprints that have been already made. What you've got to do is take a close look at those pr footprints and make sure you're more careful where you walk in the future. With God's help, brothers and sisters, that is precisely what we will do. We will walk towards reformation and reconciliation until God's dream becomes a living reality for all. It's what God is doing in and through the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom that is breaking through already in the here and now. It's the dream about another stream. But let justice roll on like a river. Righteousness like a never-failing stream. That is the stream we will work towards. A stream that everyone can drink from. Jesus said so himself. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. Isn't that beautiful? Brothers and sisters, that living water is God's own Holy Spirit living in us individually and in his church. And it is our job to lead people to the living water, not to change their appearance or culture or ethnicity. It's our calling to show the world that even in these polarizing times, there is hope. Did you notice in that video at the beginning that one little girl, when asked, which one is the bad one? She looked and she said, neither one. That response gives us hope. 
But that girl can see that there is a difference in color between the dolls, but that doesn't make one bad and the other good. In the Bible, that being said, we learn that every person really is bad since the fall. Red and yellow, black and white, they have all fallen short of God's glory in God's sight. But even with this sad truth, we know there is great hope. A hope that was hinted at already in our text from Genesis 3. Even in the middle of the curses, we read this. God said, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. That he, that offspring of Eve, was Jesus Christ himself. The offspring who turned all of Satan's hissing S's on their heads. To the serpent, there would be crushing. Suspicion would be turned to trust again. Separation would be replaced with unity. There would be no more supplements to God's word because Jesus Christ himself is the word of God. The sedition would turn to loyalty. The sin would be wiped out once and for all. When God is asked, which one of them is bad? He will say, neither one. Because they have put their trust in my beloved son. And this unity in Christ, brothers and sisters, will mean that our deep, deep shame will end up in a glorious, wonderful dignity. The image of God fully restored in us thanks to Jesus Christ. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. Lord of all nations, Lord of all tribes, Lord of all peoples, and Lord of all languages. And all of God's people say, Amen.
Brothers and sisters, please join me for the prayers of God's people. When we pray together from our diverse traditions, Holy One, who makes us one, make our unity visible and bring healing to the world. When we read the Bible together in our diversity in language and context, revealing one who makes us one, make our unity visible and bring healing to the world. When we establish relations of friendship among Jews, Christians, and Muslims, among peoples of different cultures and backgrounds, when we tear down the wall of indifference and hatred, merciful one who makes us one, make our unity visible and bring healing to the world. When we work for justice and solidarity, when we move from fear to confidence, strengthening one who makes us one, make our unity visible and bring healing to the world. Wherever there is suffering through war and violence, injustice and inequality, disease and prejudice, poverty and hopelessness, draw us near to the cross of Christ and to each other. Wounded one who makes us one, make our unity visible and bring healing to the world. With Christians of the Holy Land, we too are witnesses to the birth of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem, his ministry in Galilee, his death and resurrection, and the descent of the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem. When we yearn for peace and justice for all, in the sure and certain hope of your coming kingdom. Triune God, who makes us one, make our unity visible and bring healing to the world. Lord God, we also want to lift up Bob Dielman and, and Marion and their family as they grieve the loss of a dear father and grandfather. Lord, may your peace that passes all understanding guard their hearts and their minds in Christ Jesus knowing that their Father now is safe in your loving arms, free from sin, free from sickness, and forever with you. Lord, may that, may that be a peace and comfort for the Dealman family at this time. We ask this all in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people say, Amen. Receive God's parting blessing. May you be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen.